War of the Worlds, The Resurrection, a novel by J. M. Dillard. Chapter 2 Suzanne McCullough sat outside Dr. Jacoby's office and glanced impatiently at her watch for the thousandth time in the past twenty minutes. She'd arrived precisely five minutes before the appointed time. Coming any sooner would have revealed how anxious she was. Coming any later would have reflected poorly on a newly hired employee. Of course, she'd actually been twenty-five minutes early. It had taken less time than she expected to get Deb to school, and had wandered around the grounds to kill time. The Pacific Institute of Technology sprawled out over several acres of beautifully landscaped terrain, and at the top of one gently rising hill she'd been able to see the water. In the bright California sunshine, Ohio seemed very, very far away. God knows, they were certainly laid back around here. Jacoby was the director, and here he was, already ten minutes late. The director of Zabrowski Labs in Canton would never have been late for an appointment. Suzanne sighed and shifted on the too soft, too low couch. Even the receptionist was late, shuffling in five minutes before, although she was friendly and kind enough to offer coffee. Suzanne was tempted, but declined. She didn't trust herself not to spill it down the front of her silk blouse before Dr. Jacoby arrived. If they had just told her what type of project they'd hired her for, at least then she wouldn't be nervous and consumed by curiosity. It didn't help that Debbie had burst out crying at the breakfast table in the morning. Suzanne had been too busy searching for the box boldly labeled Kitchen Coffee Maker Top Priority to notice the storm clouds gathering. She was now convinced that it was still in the moving van on its way to Oregon, or else sitting forlornly in the empty house back in Canton. After several desperate minutes, she realized she had to give it up or be late her first day on the job. She ran her fingers through her long dark hair and sank stiffly into the kitchen chair, trying to remember where the aspirin was packed. A sniffle came from the other end of the table. Deb? She had to stand to see her. The kitchen table was littered with half-emptied cardboard boxes. Miraculously, Deb had managed to find her clothes and was dressed for her second day of school. Are you okay? Another sniffle. Yeah, I'm okay, Mom, Debbie said miserably into her cornflakes. I'm just tired. And then the dam broke. Suzanne was just tired and aching enough to join her. Between sobs, Deb managed to get it all out. It was her second day of sixth grade at the new school, but she didn't ever want to go back. She didn't like any of the other kids, they all dressed weird, not like home at all, and they thought she was a geek. Nobody would sit with her at lunch. Honey, did you ask anyone to sit with you? Stupid question to ask an eleven-year-old girl. She knew it the moment she said it. Mom, I can't ask anyone I don't know. They're supposed to ask me. Suzanne almost said, you mustn't be so shy then bit her tongue. She couldn't blame Deb for taking after her mother, personality-wise at least. Physically, Deb was the spitting image of Derek. Suzanne could still remember what it felt like. She'd spent junior high with Coke bottle glasses, a mouth full of braces, and only one close friend, an outsider like herself. I'm sorry, Deb. She walked over to stand next to the girl stroked her hair and felt a pang of guilt. Poor Deb. Today, when she got home from school, the strange new house would be empty because her mother would still be working. It's no fun starting over. I don't much like having to start a new job myself today, but these kids won't remain strangers forever. Who knows, maybe you'll make friends with some of them. I doubt it. Debbie stared down into her cereal her long blonde hair hanging perilously close to the bowl. A tear dripped into the milk. 
Suzanne knelt down next to her. I'm not trying to be mean, but you have a choice. You can either sit here and cry about it, or you can tell yourself it's going to get better. To tell you the truth, I'd just as soon cry with you, but I've got to get dressed for work. I'm sorry, Mom. Deb looked up at her mother. Her voice rose tremulously. I guess I'm just tired, and I sort of miss Dad a little. Suzanne gave her a fierce hug and swallowed back tears. She wasn't going to think about Derek now, or she would cry from sheer outrage at the way he treated his only daughter. She had stayed in Ohio for Debbie's sake so that the girl could be close to her father, but most of the time Derek didn't bother to take advantage of his visitation rights, sometimes even forgetting to come pick Deb up on the scheduled weekends. Debbie adored him, and when he did show up with his tall, blonde good looks, he charmed her into forgetting how he'd hurt her. Just like he did with your mother for all those years, she thought. She pushed the thought out of her mind and stood up, feigning cheerfulness. Now, quit crying into your cornflakes, kid, or they'll get soggy. Eat your breakfast, and when you go to school today, be sure to notice what the kids are wearing. Maybe when I get back from work tonight, we can do a little clothes shopping. All right, Deb said glumly, but her expression said, fat lot of good that'll do. But at least she'd stopped crying and finished her cereal. Now... Outside Ephraim Jacoby's office, Suzanne rose at the sight of the director of the Pacific Institute, walking toward her. He noticed her, and a smile lit up his lined, sun-browned face. Hale-looking and square-shouldered, there was nothing in the way he held himself or moved to indicate his age. He'd worked on the Manhattan Project 45 years before, when he was a young man. Suzanne calculated that he had to be at least in his early 70s though he looked more like sixty. Apparently, being director of the Institute for the past twenty years agreed with him. She took it as a hopeful sign. As he approached, Suzanne nervously returned his smile. Dr. McCullough! Jacoby adjusted his old-fashioned wire-rimmed glasses, as if to see her better, then gripped her hand with strong, bony fingers. So you're finally here at last. Good. I hope the move wasn't too traumatic. He spoke with the slightest trace of an accent. She tried to identify it and failed. Not too. Please. Jacoby gestured her toward his office. She entered and sat down across from him at his desk, which reminded her very much of her kitchen table back home, full of clutter. How on earth did the man get any work done in such a disorganized environment? Jacoby settled himself into an old wooden chair on casters that creaked as he swiveled back and forth ever so slightly in it. Must be as old as he was, Suzanne decided. It's so very good of you to have accepted our offer, he said. Good of her? Suzanne tried not to look skeptical. They'd offered her 40% more pay than she'd gotten in Ohio, plus all expenses incurred in the move, and suddenly she panicked. Damn it, she knew it was too good to be true, but she'd laid it all out to Jacoby the very first interview. Yes, she'd worked on a secret project in Canton, but it was a joint project with NASA and had nothing whatsoever to do with biological warfare, which she absolutely refused to have anything to do with. And if that was what Jacoby was offering, she'd just leave now, thank you. He'd sworn it wasn't. Nothing like that, he'd reassured her. After all, hadn't he been one of the scientists on the Manhattan Project, who'd later publicly denounced the use of atomic weapons, had demonstrated on the Capitol steps for peace? No, he permitted nothing like that to go on at the Pacific Institute, not as long as he had a breath of life in him, and he spoke with such conviction that she'd believed him. What would she do now if he told her otherwise? Quit immediately, of course, but then, what would happen to her and Debbie? She'd never be able to reimburse them the moving costs, at least not for a while. That's what you get for behaving impulsively, moving all the way to California without knowing exactly what the job was all about. Sounds more like something Derek would do. Dr. Jacoby, 
she said slowly. I am terribly curious as to what the job entails. As I told you, I refuse to engage in any sort of research that could conceivably be used for bio-warfare. His thin lips curved upward in a smile. Ah, yes, a scientist of principle, and that's why I hired you, Dr. McCullough. He rifled distractedly through a stack of pink while you were out memos as he spoke. But before we discuss details, I would like you to meet the man you'll be working with. Dr. Jacoby, she began frustrated. She was going to say, I get a strong impression that you are trying to avoid answering my question until you feel I'm caught too tightly in your web to say no. Jacoby held up his hand. He'll be able to answer all your questions for you. Dr. Harrison Blackwood, the astrophysicist, perhaps you've heard of him? No, Suzanne answered, calming down a little. An astrophysicist, then maybe they hired her because they were interested in space research of the type she'd done at Zabrowski Labs. But if he can explain, then by all means, take me to him. Blackwood's office was in a different wing of the building, which looked like it had been constructed back in the 30s. The man couldn't be very influential around here, then, if he hadn't managed to get one of the plush new offices near Jacoby's. They stopped in front of a dark wooden door that bore the single inscription, Blackwood. The sign looked as old as the rest of the building, then Dr. Blackwood was no doubt as ancient as Dr. Jacoby. Jacoby pushed open the door without knocking, catching Suzanne's raised brow, he explained. We're pretty informal around here, Doctor. You'll get used to it. He poked his head inside, then looked back at Suzanne and put his finger to his lips. Blackwood's lecturing. We let the local school children visit from time to time. I'm not sure who enjoys it more. He stepped inside and motioned for her to follow. How nice, Suzanne murmured behind him. She eased the door shut as quietly as possible. Blackwood stood speaking with his back to them. Before him, a group of children Debbie's age listened, wide-eyed, whether totally intent or totally lost. Suzanne wasn't sure. She and Dr. Jacoby tiptoed off to one side of the room. Neither Blackwood nor the children seemed to notice. In so far as concerned, Blackwood was saying, I doubt we've ever experienced a more exciting period in human history, aided by the computer and other modern research techniques. Startling discoveries are happening at an exponential rate. The room looked more like a child scientist playground than an office. The ceiling was plastered with astral maps. A huge mobile of the solar system hung suspended, as did other celestial bodies, and through this makeshift cosmos sailed an inflatable plastic model of the starship Enterprise. About a dozen antique telescopes were aimed at the open window, and above the desk hung a framed poster of Schiaparelli's Mars, complete with Canali. Jacoby settled against the wall to listen. Next to him, Suzanne tried not to stare at Dr. Blackwood. She'd pictured him as looking like her old boss at Zubrowski Labs, Dr. Solomon, overweight and almost totally bald, his pale eyes magnified by the thick lenses of his glasses. She certainly hadn't pictured him looking like... like this. Nice looking. Probably in his late thirties. Tall, over six feet with curly golden brown hair and for god's sake dressed like a college kid in a flannel shirt khakis and suspenders no tie she realized that her mouth was slightly agape and closed it a wise man once said and at this point blackwood caught sight of jacoby and winked jacoby nodded back that a person who tries to know something about everything will eventually know everything about nothing while the person who tries to know everything about one thing will eventually know nothing about everything. Suzanne frowned. Who said that? She whispered in Jacoby's ear. He shrugged, still smiling. Knowing Harrison, he did. Blackwood droned on. The kids were starting to fidget. Of both the physical and theoretical sciences, it is crucial for you to remember, always, that assumptions are fraught with danger. Scientists can't function unless they can postulate theories based on assumptions. 
but the good scientist will always remain cautious, for to assume even the obvious is to oftentimes overlook the obvious. To help illustrate this point, and here he withdrew a pocket watch from his khakis, let me give you a practical example. He opened the watch and stared at its face, counting dramatically. A couple of the kids stirred and began paying attention as they realized something was about to happen. Five, Blackwood intoned. Four, three, two, one. In one of the nearby offices, a man screamed. Blackwood's lips curved in a satisfied grin. He closed the watch and slipped it back into his pocket. Blackwood! The door to Blackwood's office slammed open, and a researcher dressed in a white smock stormed in. This man looked like Dr. Solomon, only thinner, except that his shoulders and balding head were sprinkled with brightly colored confetti. The children began to titter. Even Jacoby smiled. Suzanne forced herself to maintain a serious expression. The researcher glared at Blackwood, then realized that Jacoby was standing nearby. I'm glad Dr. Jacoby is here to witness this, Blackwood, he snapped. This has all the markings of another one of your infantile practical jokes. Blackwood took a step toward him and said in a confidential tone, Jeffrey, you really should see someone about that scalp condition. More giggles escaped. You should see someone about your mental condition, Jeffrey shouted. At that, someone in the group roared. That did it. The children howled. Jeffrey did a beautiful double take. In his fury, he apparently hadn't noticed that he had an audience. His anger faded to self-consciousness, then to red-faced embarrassment. Blackwood gestured at him like a leading man encouraging his co-star to take a bow. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Guterman, the next stop on your field trip. Dr. Guterman doesn't subscribe to my assumption theory and occasionally finds things falling down on him when he walks through doorways. I'll get you for this, Blackwood, Guterman thundered. He stormed from the room, slamming the door behind him. Blackwood was nonplussed. Why don't you look around the room for a few minutes, he told the sixth graders, while Dr. Guterman regains his composure. While the children milled around the office, Blackwood strolled over, hands in his pockets. Inspiring young minds is so rewarding. Morning, Ephraim. He turned to Suzanne, his blue eyes regarding her curiously. Hi, Harrison Blackwood. Suzanne McCullough. She felt herself frosting up. He was a charmer, just a little too glib. There was a boyishness about him that reminded her uncomfortably of Derek. He even resembled him a little physically. The fact both attracted and repelled her, but he was still too pleased with his joke on Guterman to notice. Jacoby sensed her disapproval and quit smiling. I really do wish you'd leave that poor fellow alone, Harrison, he chided mildly. Suzanne got the feeling he said it only for her sake. Blackwood grinned unrepentantly. And give up all my fun? It was clear he wasn't in the least bit afraid of Jacoby. He turned to Suzanne. I'm a firm believer that a person's reaction to a harmless practical joke is a window to his or her soul. She eyed him coolly. If he wasn't afraid of Jacoby, then by God, she wasn't afraid to let him know what she thought of his childish antic. Does that apply to whoopee cushions as well, Doctor? He blinked, but his cheerfulness never wavered. She got the feeling he understood exactly what she meant, but didn't give enough of a damn to take offense. He went right on to the next thought without missing a beat. Ephraim... Now that I have you, whatever happened to my request for a microbiologist? She drew in a breath. So, Jacoby hadn't even told him about her? She'd moved across country to come here to work for Blackwood, and Blackwood didn't even know yet. Jacoby's expression was smug. Have I ever denied you, Harrison? He rested a supportive hand on Suzanne's shoulder. Dr. McCullough has just joined us. She's yours if you want her. In a manner of speaking, 
she said, qualifying Jacoby's statement, then blushed to think that she had called attention to the double entendre herself. But Blackwood politely ignored the remark. Welcome to the Pacific Institute of Technology and Science, or as we so fondly refer to it, the pits. He extended his hand. Without thinking, she hesitated. His smile widened delightedly. I gave up handshake buzzers years ago. Assumptions are dangerous things, she reminded him, and cautiously took his hand.